Thank you. Well, uh, uh, I'm really pleased to be here um, in all kinds of ways. I, like, I give a lot of talks, really do I give a talk to a martial arts conference. And so um, it's always nice to be a white belt. Um, uh, biography, because you don't normally think about uh, academics. I've been a, a professor of law here at UCLA since 1995. About three years ago, I became a vice chancellor uh, here at UCLA. You usually don't associate, I don't know, uh, pinheaded academics and vice chancellors with martial arts. But the truth is, I've actually done a lot. Not, you know, I've always wanted to do a lot of different things, but it started mostly in college when I had both the, uh, both the time and the flexibility to participate in college clubs. I didn't go here. I went to Harvard uh, out in Boston. And, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a long list. It's slightly embarrassing. It might show that I don't actually have any focus, but, uh, you know, I did, you know, I, like a, a superintendent of my dorm did like Tai Chi and Wu Shu, so I kind of picked up stuff from him. And then I'm ethnically Korean, so then I could do Taekwondo finally. Um, you know, on the summers, there were karate uh, sort of organizations that were around. Um, and then later on, I ended up doing a lot of other Korean stuff, Hwarangdo mostly, which is kind of like Hapkido. Um, I had studied some Kendo uh, or Kumdo, depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, I did uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, to grapple a little bit. And most recently, I've been doing Muay Thai and Western style boxing. Actually, my Muay Thai coach, Coach Vic, is right here. Uh, he is brutal, but in a good way. Uh, the reason why I share with that is that part of the theme that I want to talk about is the ways in which we um, tend to expect certain things of people and why one of the things the university ought to do is to challenge our expectations. You can call it stereotyping, you can call it uh, schematic thinking or categorical thinking. One of the things that I really want to push is to go beyond what we expect of people and why it is that unexpected facts about their histories, their interests, their commitments can alter the way we interact with each other in a time of great divisiveness. So too much about me, but let me uh, move on to actually talk a little bit about the things I care about, which is equity, diversity, and inclusion. So look, uh, uh, three years ago, uh, in the fall of 2015, in the summer of 2015, a new office is created for all kinds of reasons. I am a vice chancellor of equity, diversity, and inclusion. These terms mean everything and nothing. They could be grandiloquent phrases filled with nonsense, or it could be actually trying to do a better job of what it means to promote genuine, fair shots for all of us, regardless of where we were born, how we were born, what categories we inhabit. The logo of our office is just, you know, it's just to build equity for all. I just want to create equal learning and working environments for all people. That's my goal. But that mission, that basic mission, has been really hard. Why? I mean, think about it. it I started in fall of 2015. Think about that summer of bloodshed, Black Lives Matter. Right? Think about um, the unexpected result in the presidential election. Think about Me Too. Uh, Title IX reports to me. Think about the challenges of faculty hiring. Think about DACA changes. Think about freedom of speech of Milo Yiannopoulos. Think about all the things that are rending this country apart at the national level. Global conflicts, regardless of your political commitments, global conflicts always have local manifestations. And UCLA is a city state. On any given day, there might be 70,000 people on campus. And so we have a city state that's committed to some extraordinary things, but it could not be otherwise, that if people are killing each other, right, in the Middle East, that there would not be local manifestations. And our challenge then is how do we, dem how do we demonstrate something different that allows us to build an equal learning and working environment for all, never, notwithstanding all the conflict that exists. That, that's a challenge, and I've been, I've been struggling with it. And as I've been thinking about how I'm struggling with it, I notice that oftentimes what I'm trying to do is to create I don't know, a coherence or a reconciliation um, amongst at least three different concepts. One is passion, oftentimes an oversupply. Two, intelligence, oftentimes a deficit. Three, humility, definitely a deficit. So I'm trying to reconcile what it means to have genuine passion, to actually exercise your intelligence. We are at a tier one research university, for better and worse. And I think we actually have obligations to use our minds. And again, to deal with the fact that we might actually be wrong, right? What humility is all about. So I'm trying to reconcile those things in a conflict of great 
pain, sometimes cruelty, sometimes just trolling, right? Just right wing, left wing trolling in all kinds of ways that happens on a campus like this. So I'm trying to reconcile those things. So I was thinking a little bit about what it is that martial arts might have to say about passion, about intelligence, and about humility. So let's think a little bit about passion. And the great thing about martial arts is that it oftentimes shows you both good and bad, both sides of it. What does martial arts teach us about passion? Certainly about the good, like you, you gotta commit, you gotta have passion, you gotta be enthusiastic. If you don't put in the effort, there's no way you'll survive. So it demonstrates why it's good, but passion is also tied to a certain kind of emotional reaction. And if you cannot control your passions, if you cannot control your emotions, if you cannot control your fear, then we know what it means for your body to shut down when you're overwhelmed by the senses. If you're in the pocket, right, when there's a flurry of punches, if you're actually getting an elbow to the face, there's a lot of stuff that will actually explode in your emotions. And if you cannot control that passion and be in the moment and not be merely reactive but also respond, then you will lose. So passion is both good and if you can't control it, it can be bad. What can passion also tell us, what, what can martial arts teach us about intelligence. Now, and sometimes we don't think of it as intelligence, but I think that's a very narrow way to think about intelligence, however you define it. It turns out that intelligence is unbelievably important to become an excellent martial artist, right? You know, whether you listen, like if you go on YouTube and listen to the commentary like John Donner from Henzo Gracie's uh, uh, school, or like, you know, Faraz Zahabi or other people, if you don't actually understand why leverage work, why, why leverage works, why technique works in a particular kind of way, if you don't use your mind, if you don't have a game plan, right, in a fight, no matter how good you are, it's just brute strength. Brute strength, it get, don't get me wrong, is unbelievably valuable, it turns out. You know what I'm talking about. Brute strength is really very powerful. It's, it's important to be 20 uh, uh, with, your, with your ACL intact, uh, which is not what I have. Uh, but the point is, it turns out intelligence is incredibly important in all kinds of ways. Now, intelligence also has its downside because I deal with a bunch of academics, right? Intelligence that leads to either qualification, too much talking, or a defensiveness that is well defended, again, with a bunch of excuses, a bunch of reasons, and a resistance to actual encounter in the moment, that kind of intelligence gets in the way. You need both a certain kind of smarts that comes from physical experience, as well as a smarts that comes from a willingness to step back and learn from the past and to actually see things which are otherwise invisible through mind sciences or other kinds of techniques. Martial arts teach us, uh, teaches us the importance of intelligence and the danger that it could actually lead you astray. The final thing I want to really emphasize is humility, right? Martial arts will teach you, if you are a serious practitioner, a combat sports martial artist, however you want to view yourself, it teaches you fundamentally humility. First off, you realize the fragility of the human body. If you've never been like kicked in the thigh before, like who knew it could hurt that much? <laughs> who knew? If you've never been put into a wrist lock or a shoulder lock, who knew? If you couldn't even track a barambolo, right? Because like, what is that three-dimensional thing spinning? How did it get to my back and why am I not breathing? Like, the, like who knew? There's a certain kind of humility that it teaches you with the expert technologies of human body movement, right? And so no matter how good you thought you were in whatever disciplines, you can find a discipline that teaches you great humility, and that's extraordinary. It also teaches you humility about other people. It's like, oh yeah, that person's smaller, maybe a different gender, like, oh, no worries, got this. No, maybe, often, but not always. And that kind of humility that you might have read someone incorrectly, including yourself incorrectly, is so important to, I get, to the advancement of your physical practice, but also what we need back on campus. I'm not saying being humble, or certainly not humble bragging, but being genuinely humble or being timid is also always good because there are downsides to humility if you lack the self-confidence to execute. If you lack a bias for action, if you can never bite down on your mouth guard and throw, that's also a problem. That's also a problem. But it teaches you both sides. And what I love about the martial arts when best practice is that the best, most, sort of the best fighters that I admire most are deeply humble people. Like they know how dangerous the human body is. And they don't have a need to demonstrate because they understand the fragility. The reason why I talk about those, all those things is that can martial arts then 
in the way that it unpacks and I kind of, you know, shows the complexities of passion, the importance of intelligence, the nature of humility, help the university campus. And I think it actually can. I'll just pick a couple examples, like, you know, uh, like microaggressions, right? People talk about microaggressions all the time on campus. What does that mean? Well, at bottom, it means nothing more than a basic insight you should have learned in high school poetry, that the intent of your words doesn't fully control the meaning. Like I didn't intend, when like someone compliments me on my English, I'm an immigrant first generation, they might not have intended to actually put me off, but maybe I feel it that way. It's not that interesting, it happens all the time. The intent of your message doesn't fully control. If you've ever been in fight with your significant other, you know this is true. <laughs> Nevertheless, it raises all kinds of issues. What can martial arts teach us about just that basic idea? Well, like the intent of you not throwing a very hard counter might not have been experienced by the other person. And he might say like, whoa, 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 I thought we were doing light sparring, what was that about? And you're like, I didn't intend to hit you that hard. It doesn't matter, he felt it that hard. And if you don't scale down, he's gonna throw back even harder. It is what it is. So the question is, what kind of relationship do you wanna have with another person? I get it, not everyone's a sparring partner where you're learning together. But what kind of relationship do you wanna have with another human being who is on this campus, who is a fellow Bruin? Do you not care that you threw with the best of intentions, but it actually landed with the worst of impact? That's all that we have to think about. Now, let's think also a second about consent. Title IX reports to me. Think about what Me Too means. Oftentimes for men, you know, consent could mean like, well, I don't know. Like, there's a certain kind of resistance to really understanding what consent is. Sometimes what I say is like, have you never wanted to just do light sparring? Someone even asks you, let's spar, and you spar, but then there's an escalation, and you're like, no, 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 no. That, that's a little too much. But the escalation continues. At some point, you can walk away and stop, you know, I'm not into this. But there's a whole bunch of defensiveness, there's kind of ego, there's like, no, no, I can take that, it's okay, that wasn't too hard. And there's a weird escalation where the context doesn't allow you to experience consent in a way that you really ought to. Can martial arts teach us about different things that are going on in the university? Maybe the final thing that I want to emphasize, because uh, you know, the danger with academics is we go on too long. The final things that I want to uh, emphasize is, again, uh, something in social psychology that's called stereotype threat or social identity threat. And there's just great evidence that says that if you're in an environment that puts you under threat, maybe because you're not well represented in the environment. So you might be, I don't know, you might be like a white guy in Korea in a Taekwondo Dojang, right? You might be, uh, you know, a woman studying physics. It might be just right on, I was a physics major, okay. So, um, uh, uh, Whatever the underrepresentation is, or it might be because the the rap around the rap about your people is that your people suck at this, right? You like your like you, you can't dance, you can't jump, you can't do various things, right? Uh, maybe the rap around my people is that I can do taekwondo, but maybe I can't do muay thai. Like ask my coach. Uh, so <laughs> the point is, there are certain environments where there's kind of a bad miasma that says like, yeah, you don't. It's not clear that you'll succeed. There's great evidence that if you are placed in that environment, even though you disagree and reject the stereotype, like that doesn't apply to me, like that's inaccurate, not for me. There's great evidence that that environment will create enough interference with both short-term memory, drive a certain kind of emotional um, vigilance reaction that actually detracts from your performance in the moment at things as uh, objective as standardized tests. So the environment actually alters your performance. And my job to build an equal learning environment for all is to make sure that this environment allows everyone to flourish to the best of her abilities, right? What does the martial arts say about that? I mean, it's really interesting if you think about it, right? Do you belong? Do you belong? Have you ever been in a situation where you feel, felt great threat, like you, you join a new gym? right? And you might think like, I don't know, this is a gym. And then that you think like maybe for ethnic or cultural reasons, it's like the people in charge look differently from you. Do you belong? Or you're thinking like, oh, no, no, they're not who I thought it would be. Like, is that cultural appropriation? Do you belong? There's all kinds of moments where you think maybe you don't belong. 
but through the shared labor and the physical contact, the teamwork necessary to succeed in the martial arts, you ultimately realize two things, that you can belong and that everything is learnable. That If you actually put in the reps, put in the time, notwithstanding what you thought you couldn't possibly do over a decade's worth of focus practice, you can do remarkable things. Just those combinations of feeling that you belong and realizing you put in the reps, you can do the work, those are what scientists have demonstrated to be the countermeasures that allow people to flourish, notwithstanding the miasma in their environment. Those are the interventions I'm constantly trying to explore and push out to students here at UCLA when they're underrepresented and under a certain kind of threat that they don't belong. What can martial arts teach us? I actually think martial arts can teach us a great deal because when I see the great conflicts, whether it's a contentious speaker or people who don't know how to engage across divisive topics and moments of freedom of expression lurching out, what comes to mind, as I reflected on the comments here, what comes to mind is basically it's no different than having like 30 white belts under your control who have no experience, who go out into a melee. Just imagine that, just one. Those are dangerous people because they're all stressed out, they're enraged, they have no technique, they don't know how to block, take a punch, they don't know how to just evade, you know, they don't know how to just chill out. It's like, I can just control distance here, like, I'm not, I don't even have to even take any contact, right? I could smile and just move, right? All I need to do is a pivot. What we have now, in truth, Notwithstanding the intense passions, I, I do not mean to undermine the significance of those moral commitments and political commitments. And I mean clear, uh, I mean to be completely honest, when, when we say we do kill each other for less in other parts of the globe. It has always happened, it will always happen. But when I see those kinds of passions without the experience of how to deal with conflict, how to understand the rules of engagement, how to understand the fragility of the human psyche and the human body, then what you have our rumbles, melees, unsophisticated engagements that lead to, again, just horrific messes. What can you do as genuine teachers of the martial arts, right? You can teach people how to deal with conflict. You can teach what it means to have passion but not let it go out of control. You can teach them in a university concept, context to remember the obligation to use our minds and you can always teach everyone to be a little bit more humble, that we might be wrong and notwithstanding decades of some privileged status, whether it be a distinguished professor, some grand poobah status that, again, empiricism will show that we're all fragile, we're all human, we're all wrong, and we could all learn from our engagements. So I think that's a lot that martial arts can teach us. You are the diffusers of this culture into different domains, including the university. And I'm really excited that we are convening here to actually think about passion, to think about intelligence, to think about, again, humility in the context of interactions and knowledge sharing across so many different communities. And for that, I'm deeply thankful to Paul, to other people who have set up this event. Uh, unfortunately, I have to run off to another engagement, so I won't be able to stay, but I will definitely see things on uh, online uh, when they get uploaded. Uh, it's with great appreciation that uh, that I engage you this morning. Uh, have a terrific day, and thanks for all that you do.